and on the other side okay all right so we are going to continue our discussion uh, on differentiation of functions uh, so in the previous class we talked about directional derivatives so I had a function f from r n to r and the gradient of f at x was a vector with partial derivative with respect to x1, partial derivative with respect to xn and this vector resides in rn. Okay. The second derivative, uh, oh, so let's consider a function g that maps from Rn to Rr. Okay. The derivative of g is defined as well. Before we talk about derivative, I'm going to split g into multiple functions. So g of x is g1 of x, gr of x. Okay. So each gi maps from Rn to R. Okay. My goal is to compute the derivative of gx and what, how should we do that? Well, the convention is that the derivative of gx will be derivative of g1x, derivative of g2x, gnx. Okay, this is the convention. So this is how you define the derivative of a function that maps to a Euclidean space and not a real line. Will it be R instead of N? Oh, of course. Good, you are not sleeping. <laughs> okay, so this is how you define the derivative of G. Now, once you understand, so these are the derivative of G1, G2, G3, all of them stacked as columns of a matrix. So this is a matrix in Rn cross R. Now once I've introduced this derivative, I want you to think about what the second derivative of Fx would look like. Yes. Which n? Uh, this? So Rn is the n-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. So this x contains n elements. Okay. okay, so it's not just x, it's x1, x2, x3, all the way to xn. Uh, yeah, the structure. Uh -huh. so n by R by n. Could it be n by R by n? No. Okay. No. no. Think a little bit. So the second derivative of f is the derivative of the first derivative of f, right? And as we have seen, the first derivative of f is a set of n functions stacked as column. So yeah, Omar. Yes. And this would reside in which space? N by N. N, by N? 
right? So let's look at what this would actually look like Okay, so this is what, if you unravel the equation, this is exactly what it's going to look like. Yes? So what would happen if you took the third derivative? Ah, good question. So what happens if you take the third derivative of this function? Any thoughts? Yes. Is it a tensor? It's a tensor. How do you draw like right there? <laughs> <laughs> you you, you take yeah, you talk about each layer. Okay. I mean in MATLAB you can write a tensor, right? It's right. whatever, right? So it's a three so the third derivative of F would be in R N cross N cross N. Okay. So it will be a collection of n such matrices, okay? So you can think of it as a three-dimensional matrix, like a block, like a cube. Yeah, and it's, it's generally, I mean, it's not like these things are not studied. It is studied under the umbrella of tensors. So, but we are not going to talk about tensors in this class. In fact, I don't know much about tensors. That's why I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Now, what is the property of this matrix? Symmetric. Why? Schwarz theorem. If the second partial derivatives are continuous, then the partials are commutative. Yes. So, if the second derivative is continuous, and for the purpose of this course, we are always going to consider functions whose, which is infinitely differentiable. So, you have first derivative, you have second, you have third, you have fourth, you have fifth. You know, it goes on and on. So, of course, second derivative would be continuous. And if second derivative is continuous, then del 2f over del xi del xj then this is satisfied. So, if the second derivative is continuous, and therefore, this is actually a symmetric matrix. So, second derivative of f transpose is second derivative of f itself. Okay, so that's why we were talking about symmetric matrices in the previous class. Questions? Uh, what if there is a discontinuity in the Then you can't have this, this commutative property will not hold. And so it won't be a symmetric matrix anymore. Basically, if you look at the derivative, if it is not continuous, then you could have a discontinuity if you're traveling in one of the directions. Let's say if you're traveling in xi direction, there is a discontinuity. So then the derivatives will not be the same. Yes. Which one? Uh, uh, this one? Yeah. I don't know what the name of this is, but this is a classical result in calculus. Uh, yeah. Any other question? Okay.
Now I want to talk about the chain rule. Okay, so if f was a function from r to r and g was also a function from r to r and I define h as g of f of x, so it's a composition of two functions. What is the derivative of h? Or Anyone remembers? This is known as chain rule. I'm sure you would have studied it in one class or the other. Yes, g prime of f of x, f prime of x, right? So derivative, the first derivative of g evaluated at fx <coughs> multiplied by derivative of f evaluated at x. Okay, so this is the, known as the chain rule. And you would have studied it in the context of functions of real variables. Now for vector, the result is slightly similar. So f is a function from Rn to Rr. G is a function from Rr to R. Then gradient of h of x is gradient of f of x gradient of g evaluated at f of x. Okay? This is a matrix. What's the dimension of this matrix? R n cross R. And this is a matrix. And the dimension of this is R R. So you have a matrix of n cross R dimension. You multiply it by vector of dimension R. You get a vector of dimension n. And of course, H is a function from R n to R. So the equation is dimensionally correct. Okay. Uh, if you want to derive that equation from first principle, just apply these definitions and you will notice that the derivative of H is uh, The first row, so, well, you can, you can do this matrix multiplication. You can compute the derivative of H from first principles, and then you can see that the two equations actually match. So that's how you can derive that expression easily. There are some pretty well-known theorems uh, in once you understand differentiation. So the first most important theorem is mean value theorem. So f from Rn to R, x, y, in R n, then F y is equal to F x plus uh, there exist alpha y in 0 1 such that F of y equals to F of x plus gradient of f alpha y x plus 1 minus alpha y y 
transpose y minus x. Okay, so what does this say? <clears throat> I have a point x, I have a point y. I want to find out the value of f at y. Then that is equal to the value of f at x plus you draw, you draw a line between x and y and there is a point somewhere in the middle, let me call it c. Okay, so this is my c point. such that the value at y is the value at x plus the gradient at c, which is a point on this line segment, transpose y minus x. Okay, that's what mean value theorem is. Any question? Yes. How are we going to use it, this mean value theorem in algorithms? I'll give you an assignment and you will get a chance to use it. <laughs> we just need differentiable here. We just need differentiability and I think we need also continuity of the first derivative. Okay. Another related result is Taylor series. There are many ways to write Taylor series. Uh, so the setting is f is a function from Rn to R, x and d are vectors in R, Rn. This is fx plus d transpose gradient of fx plus 1 over 2 factorial higher order terms. Yes. D to the, this is D transpose, so D is a vector. So I'm taking the transpose of that vector, okay? Usually, uh, in optimization, okay? So not in general, but in optimization, D is a very small vector, okay? So then you actually approximate the Taylor series by writing it this way, small o of norm of d, okay? So what this means is, so small o of x over x limit x goes to infinity or, sorry, x goes to zero is equal to zero. Okay, so this is small o, not a big o. Yes? Second term. Yeah. So the third term would be 1 over 3 factorial third derivative of f at x d d d. What does that mean? So remember I told you that the third derivative is a three dimensional matrix. So you multiply it by d along one of the dimension, then you multiply it by d again along other dimension, and then you multiply by d along again along the third dimension. Okay and then you can keep going on. 
So this is Taylor series when you want to truncate. Uh, this is the first order Taylor series. You can write the second order Taylor series by fx plus d transpose gradient of fx plus 1 over t d transpose t plus small o of d square. Yes. Uh, will that give a one-dimensional? Yeah, this will be a one-dimensional one object because so because, uh, to a matrix you multiply d on both the sides you get one dimension, right? So you do the same thing but along three sides so you get one-dimensional number. Okay. So this is the first. This is the actual Taylor series. This is the first-order Taylor series. This is the second-order Taylor series, and so all of these uh, would be important in optimization. Partly because the direction, the d, uh, direction d that we will be taking would be very, very small. Okay? Questions? Yes? So the little o function means that this term becomes very, very small as d goes to 0, negligibly small. Okay, So you can actually ignore this in doing your calculations. There was another question. Yeah. Can we always typically just get away with the first order approximation? So, uh, like, we'll get to it in a bit. Okay, So we use this in Newton's method. We use this in gradient descent. So they are, they are useful in some context and may not be useful in other contexts. Any other question? Okay. So now is the last review part for this particular, uh, before we start on the actual theory of optimization, which is convex functions and convex sets. So if there are no more questions on differentiation, I can move on to convex functions and sets. Okay, no questions. Convex set. Okay, so convexity is a very important idea for optimization. Uh, and so the essentials of convexity starts from understanding what convex sets are, and then we understand what convex functions are. And then I'm going to use the differentiation of functions to characterize convex functions. So give you a definition, the equivalent definition of convex functions based on the derivative properties of the function. So what is a convex set? So I have x, it's a subset in Rn. So is convex if and only if for every x1, x2 in the set capital X, alpha in 0, 1 alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 also lies in x. <coughs> okay. So picture, this is my set X. I pick any two points, X1, X2, and I draw the line segment joining X1 and X2. So this is the straight line between X1 and X2. And the entire line segment stays within the set X. Okay, let's look at 
a non convex set okay i pick two points x1 x2 draw a line segment and in this case the line segment stays in the set okay i made a mistake uh, <laughs> i have to pick this point x1 this point x2 and i draw a line segment and as you can see the line segment doesn't stay in the set x okay so this should hold for all x1 and x2 pair so in this case no matter which x1 x2 pair you pick the line segment always stays in x whereas in this case for some x1 x2 pairs the line segment stays in x but there are others where the line segment doesn't stay in x okay so there is at least some part of the line segment that is not in x and therefore it's a non convex set and this is a convex set okay have you seen this definition before okay everyone is nodding this and what i'm doing here okay uh, i guess i can move faster then well not really anyone who has not seen this definition before okay there are still some people okay so for the greater good of humanity i'm going to go slow at least in this class okay all right so examples of convex set c1 x such that ax less than equal to b or x such that a2x equal to b2 x such that norm of x q norm is less than equal to r okay these are all convex sets okay yes the one is assumed to be non negative or not necessarily doesn't matter yeah um so what do i mean by a vector is less than equal to another vector it means element wise uh so this means element wise the ith element of a1x is less than the ith element of b1 element wise ordering so 1 to is less than equal to 5 6 but 2 1 is not less than equal to 1 5 okay so there is no ordering here but there is an ordering here and that's what i mean when i write a1x less than equal to b1 the can someone give me an example of a non convex set donut. sorry donut. donut yeah of course okay so this is a non convex set so it would be given by well uh i want to give it some other name so b x such that r1 is less than equal to r2 r1 is strictly positive like, is there any condition for b1 b2 like no no condition for b1 b2 so you could be empty this could be an empty set too so empty set is by definition convex because there are no elements in it b1 need not lie in c1 the set so b1 will lie in the range space of a1 okay so if a1 is an m cross n matrix then b will be 
RM. B will be in RM. Okay, another uh, non convex set is sphere. Okay, so sphere is non convex. Well, just the surface of the sphere that's a non convex set uh, because the line segment joining antipodal points doesn't lie in the set at all. So, yes? Uh, in geometrical context, the first norm means it's a radius, right? This one? Uh, yes. Yeah. The, the one norm. Yeah, one norm. So, what is it? Uh, I was just confirming that it's a radius. Yeah, so you can have. Uh, so, this set is norm of x 1 less than equal to 1 and then this is norm of x 2 less than equal to 1 and this is norm of x infinity less than equal to 1. So, no matter which norm you take, the set is always going to be convex. No sphere. So, so this sphere is not well. Just the surface of the sphere. Oh. So you're not considering the solid. Yeah, yeah. You're not considering the solid ball. Just the sphere. Okay. So usually in math, you if it is a solid sphere, you call it a ball. If it is just the surface, you call it a sphere. Okay. So that's just the nomenclature. Now one. Uh, Cool thing about convex sets is that the intersection of convex set is always convex. Okay. So coolness factor if I pick a collection of convex sets, I take the intersection is convex. So questions? Let me ask this question. So how would I show that C1 is a convex set? Okay, so let's try and let's try and uh, prove that C1 is convex. So I pick x1, x2 in C1 uh, and I pick alpha in 0, 1. Then I know that ax1 is less than or equal to b1, a1, x2 is less than or equal to b1. Then this implies that a1 alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 is equal to alpha a1 x1 plus 1 minus alpha a2 x2. And I know that element wise each of the element of this particular matrix or rather vector is less than or equal to b1. Elements in this is less than or equal to b, b1. So I get alpha v1 plus 1 minus alpha v1 equals to v1. Okay, and this is what we wanted to prove that this is less than or equal to v1. So this implies okay, 
That's a usual way of proving that a set is convex. So what is this i belongs to i convex? So this is just the index set of the, uh, so it could be, for instance, you can take two convex sets, five convex sets, 500 convex sets, one million convex sets. The intersection will always be convex. Okay, is this is this result clear to everyone? Any questions on this? Um, yeah. Oh, A1, X2, yeah. Okay, you can apply the same idea here and you will have an equality, so therefore this set is convex. For proving that this set is convex, you just have to use the triangle inequality of the norm. So let's do that. So I pick x1, x2 in C3, alpha in 0, 1, and then I look at the norm of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2. By triangle inequality, this is less than or equal to So once you become proficient in dealing with norms and vectors and so on, it becomes extremely easy to show that a set is convex, okay? And usually in optimization, the class of convex sets that you would normally deal with would either be this one, this one, or this one, or intersections of these sets, okay? So that's why these three sets are very important convex sets and used heavily in optimization. Any question? Okay. Now, the next topic is convex functions. I have a function f from r n to r is convex if and only if there are various definitions, equivalent definitions of convexity. So the first and uh, most elementary definition is for every x1, x2 in r n, alpha in 0, 1, f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 is less than equal to
Okay, so picture. What does it look like? So this is my Rn. This is my R. And a function that looks something like this. I pick x1, I pick x2, and I pick an alpha which is between 0 and 1. So let me pick this point. OK? So the function here is, this is my fx1. This is my f of x2. And this point is my f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2. OK? And what this definition is saying is if I draw a line between f of x1 and f of x2, and I look at this particular point on the line segment, it's always above the function value at that particular point. Okay? So a convex function looks like a bowl, okay? A regular bowl, not some fancy bowl that you would have bought at Target or Walmart, okay? Just a regular bowl, just pick the cheapest bowl you can find and that's a convex function, okay? So what's the other property of convex function? Well, let's look at this function. And let's look at the domain, I mean the set of x that is below some value r, okay? This is a convex set, okay? And that's the second equivalent definition of a convex function. So, uh, Let me think, oh no, that's not a, okay. So, no, uh, this is a property of convex function. So sub-level, so this is known as f is convex implies sub-level sets of f are convex. Okay, and the sublevel sets of F are defined as X such that F of X is less than or equal to R. And you can change R to any, you can pick R to be any real number. And it's a property of convex function that sublevel sets of the function is, uh, is convex. But you could have non convex functions whose sublevel sets are also convex. Okay, so you can't really use sublevel sets to define convex function, it's just a property. But we can use, there are other equivalent definitions of convex function. The next definition is Fy is greater than or equal to Fx plus Y minus X transpose gradient of Fx. This should hold for all x and y, Rn. Okay, so let's see what this, what this means. I have this convex function. I pick any point x. And 
and this quantity is an equation of a hyperplane with normal gradient of fx. So that looks like this. The normal is gradient of fx. Okay? So this this hyperplane is f of x plus z minus x transpose gradient of fx. equal to 0. Would it be equal to 0 or something else? Yeah, I think it will be equal to 0. So that's this hyperplane. And what that is saying is you pick any other y uh, and you look at f of y, f of y will lie above the hyperplane. Okay, that's the second definition of convex function. No matter which point x you pick, you draw a hyperplane which, which is uh, passing through that fx and uh, the function value, the, the entire function would lie above that hyperplane. Uh, that's the second definition of convex function. And it, of course, requires the function to be differentiable once. And the third equivalent definition is that the second derivative of function be positive definite, not definite, positive semi-definite for all x in Rn. Sorry? Is that Z equal? No, this is, so Z is, appears here. So this is the set of all Z that satisfies this expression. Okay, so that's this hyperplane. Okay? So we have three definitions of convex functions. One which says, if I draw a line between fx1 and fx2, it will lie above the function in between that uh, segment x1 and x2. The second definition says, if I pick a point x and I look at fx and I draw a hyperplane with normal gradient of fx at that particular point, the function stays above that hyperplane. And the third definition, is that the function should have positive curvature, which means that the second derivative of function should be positive semi-definite. Okay, so positive semi-definite is something that we reviewed in the previous class. So it's a symmetric matrix, as we have seen, and we require the eigenvalues of this matrix to be non-negative. So it can be zero, it can be any positive number, but it should not be below zero and then the function is convex. Now you could have situations in optimization where your function is not differentiable, in which case you have to use this definition for convexity. If your function has first derivative, you can use this definition. If your function is twice differentiable, you can use this definition. Of course, for in this course, we are not looking at non-differentiable functions. So in most of the times, we'll be considering this particular definition of convexity. But as you take higher and higher uh, levels of courses in optimization, uh, this becomes extremely important. Yes? So if m is a function of, from Rn to Rm, then can we still use the first definition? Like the first? No. You cannot, because uh, uh, because convex functions is always defined. So this could be any space, okay? But this has to be R. That's how convex functions are defined, okay?
Any other question? So the first definition would always uh, give us if the function is convex or not. Yes. So all three are equivalent definitions, but, but yeah, it, for two and three we need uh, you need yeah so more conditions on uh, logarithmic won't be able to like if you're taking two range and then log logarithmic functions to make them convex. In those cases, we cannot use second and third. Let's look. So log is log looks like this. So it's concave, it's not convex. So let's say negative of log. Negative, yeah. negative of log would look like this. So it is convex from Range. open interval zero infinity, right. but not closed interval. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. Is it okay to assume that the second and third definitions would be easier to use and the function is easier, easy to differentiate. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now I want to cover, I just have two minutes, so I just want to cover separating hyperplane theorem, a very important uh, consequence of convexity. Separating hyperplane theorem. I have C1, C2 convex non empty sets or and also disjoint. So there is no point in common between C1 and C2. This implies there exists A in Rn, A not equal to 0, such that A transpose x1 is less than equal to A transpose x2 for every x1 in C1, x2 in C2. Okay, so what this is saying, I have one convex set, I have a second convex set, I can always draw, and they are disjoint, so they, there is no point in common between these two sets. I can draw a linear hyperplane which separates these two sets. On, so one set is on one side, other set is on the other side. And the hyperplane would be A transpose X equal to something, okay? Which would depend on how, where these sets are located in the space. So this is known as separating hyperplane theorem. Again, very important result, which we will use, I think, two months later, two or three months later, we'll use it for proving one of the results on optimization. So that's all I have for today, and we'll meet on Monday. Have a good weekend.